Welcome everybody. We're going to make a start now at seven o'clock. Welcome to the presentation on medical abortion management of presentations post procedure. My name is Kath Hannan and I am the project manager at the Sexual and Reproductive Health Clinical Champion Project, which is based at the Royal, Royal Women's Hospital. I'm very proud to welcome you to the session today and it's a combined effort across a number of organisations, in particular WISE, Women's Health in the South East, and representation from uh, Peninsula Health and Monash Health, and also um, Sarah Jeffs, who um, I'll introduce uh, a little bit later on. So thanks everyone for your contribution. Just to start with, uh, to acknowledge the country, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we deliver and participate on this webinar. In acknowledging country, I ask you to reflect on the country on which you are on today. For Patty and I, we're in Parkville, and I would like to acknowledge that this event takes place on the Wurundjeri and the Bururong people. We pay our respects to them, uh, elders past, present and emerging, and extend that respect to any First Nations people who are present today. We acknowledge that Aboriginal sovereignty has not been ceded and remains strong in their endearing connection to land and culture. Of course, I forgot that. Acknowledgement of country, and then just to um, inform you just to how we're going to run the webinar today, we have allowed an hour and 30 minutes. And just to let you know that you can see us as the panelists, but we can't see you. And just if you do want to adjust your view, go to the top right hand corner to select speaker view. We're going to be taking questions uh, through the uh, seminar, so just use the chat. Uh, possibly at the bottom of your screen, actually it's at the top of my screen while I'm sharing, so just have a look around. Um, and also the webinar is being recorded, it will be sent to you after the event ends and we will also de-identify uh, any information um, in the event, from the event. Um, so the session um, outline, I'm sorry, um, actually what I was going to say, I don't is that um, you'll be aware that this is a follow-up session from uh, an event that we held in September um, a, a couple of months ago, which was a, um, a broader outline around managing medical abortion in GP practice. And this session is around um, following up presentations or complications post-procedure. Um, in terms of medical abortion, we know that it sits in primary care, it's safe, effective and acceptable um, to women. But what we, we know generally through the work of the Clinical Champion Project and in response to our last webinar is that clinicians are looking for more um, information and support to um, be guided with a framework around managing a complication or a presentation post-procedure. And this event uh, intends to fill that gap in knowledge. And I'd like to um, introduce you to and, and welcome Dr. Sarah Jeffs, who's uh, a GP in uh, the South um, Metro area down at Rosebud Super Clinic. And Sarah will be um, presenting her, her case study of her very early experience around um, providing a medical abortion procedure. And Dr. Patty Moore, who's my colleague in the Clinical Champion Project, Patty's the head of abortion and contraception services at the women's and also clinical lead in the sexual and reproductive health clinical champion project. And Patty will be presenting around the principles of care of um, post-procedure medical abortion. Um, I'm going to run you through some of the resources that are available um, for follow-up. And uh, we have a Q&A uh, session following that. And next steps are uh, thinking about how we want to continue to um, up, uh, guide our knowledge and update ourselves around medical abortion. So now I'm going to hand over to Sarah uh, for her case study presentation.
Um, so while we're just waiting for the slides to come up, thank you. Thank you, Kath, for that introduction. Um, and thank you all again for attending this evening. Um, you may remember me from um, uh, from last time. Um, my name is Sarah Jeffs. Um, I'm a GP at the Rosebud Super Clinic. Um, and in February next year, I'll be practicing out of um, Safety Beach Medical and Wellness Practice, which is um, a new venture for my husband and I. So the plan um, with tonight's talks is to spend a bit more time on the follow-up of early medical abortions um, and talk through, um, I'll talk through um, a case study as Kath alluded to that um, I had an experience of very early on, which led to me starting um, to become a provider myself. So I think we're just having a little bit of difficulty with the slides there. Um, but I'll just keep talking because there's, um, it probably doesn't matter too much if we can't see the words at the moment. Um, so um, firstly, just a reminder of the individuals, organizations and services we utilize um, when providing early medical abortions in the community. Um, thank you, Jess. So next slide, if that's okay. Um, so you obviously need a GP um, who is a registered prescriber of MS2 step. Um, if you're fortunate enough to have a practice nurse or a nurse practitioner um, who are keen to be more involved, then they can be invaluable in some of the pre-treatment counseling and follow-up planning um, with both phone calls and face-to-face. -face. Um, we've certainly used more telehealth appointments in this last year with the pandemic. Secondly, you need um, a, a good relationship with a, a local pharmacy who is a registered dispenser of the MS2 step and you can um, and who are prepared to keep a stock of this. Um, our local pharmacist um, keeps two in stock um, at all times. Um, radi radiology is really important for establishing the location of the pregnancy and gestational age and pathology. So we have Melbourne pathology in our clinic um, who are very responsive and we tend to get beta HCGs and blood tests back within 24 hours of taking them. So lastly, but in a lot of ways, most importantly is the support of the specialist and secondary care organization. We're fortunate that on the peninsula, we have a very supportive early pregnancy advisory service at Frankston Hospital which is available during the daytime hours in the week. And then out of hours, you can get advice from the on-call obstetric registrar um, over the phone and if need be the emergency department. Thank you, Jess. So this is a summary of the model of care I work on. Um, I'll have on average four patient contacts. So I have an initial appointment. The second appointment is where the patient is issued with the script. And the third is a um, contact is a telephone consult with repeat, H, B, repeat beta HCG results. Um, the fourth contact then is two weeks after the procedure um, and is an opportunity to touch base on how everything went and um, contraceptive planning. Thank you, Jess. Now I didn't include this slide last time, but thought I would this time. This is a summary of the local organizations providing both medical and surgical terminations near us on the peninsula and their costs. So there's currently no Medicare rebate for providing this service in general practice other than the consultation billing. Um, if you are a private or mixed billing practice, you may charge an out of pocket for this service. Um, I think the important thing to remember here is it is really very desirable for women to be able to access medical terminations and follow up close to home from their GP who they know and trust. Um, so I'll let you just have a little read of those um, of the slide there, but really sort of you're looking on average um, anywhere between 400 and sort of up to $600 um, for the um, other providers. Thanks, Jess. So <clears throat> this case study is one of my patients um, who had a medical termination in 2017. Now this was before I was a registered provider of the MS2 step and she was one of the reasons I started exploring the area of medicine more. 
I recognised that I could have done things differently um, that could have improved her experience. So she was a 30 year old lady. Um, she has three children. The youngest is 14 months old um, and she was still breastfeeding and taking the mini pill. So she has had five previous pregnancies and one previous ectopic in that. So this was an unplanned and unwanted pregnancy. She had had one period in the last postnatal, in, in the postnatal time, um, which was the month prior. And this was on, um, and this was effectively a normal period for her. Um, she had some pregnancy symptoms, including breast tenderness and nausea, but was otherwise asymptomatic. So we discussed her feelings around the pregnancy and she was confident she couldn't continue with the pregnancy and she wanted to explore termination options. So we agreed to do bloods, a dating scan, and I gave her information of different options and providers for terminations. Thank you, Jess. So the following day, we got her BTRHCG results back and it was 465. The rest of her bloods were fine. So hemoglobin, ferritin, she was rhesus positive and her infection screen also came back clear. So two days after that, she booked, she had booked in for her scan. Um, and that showed a possible small intrauterine gestational sac measuring only four millimeters in size, which was too small to accurately evaluate dates and, it, and there was no fetal pole or yolk sac seen. So this is the first point to make with the importance of a good menstrual history and beta HCGs to gauge the gestational age. Had I reflected on the beta HCG properly on day one or two, I would have recognized that she was probably about four weeks and a dating scan at this gestation is not that helpful. So without identifying a yolk sac, you can neither exclude an ectopic, as this could be a pseudo sac or accurately date the pregnancy. So the plan then was made for a follow-up scan two to three weeks later um, and that's what we did. Thank you, Jess, next slide. Now, I didn't actually see her until um, day seven after my initial consult. So she had her bloods day one, scan day three, and then I saw her day seven. Um, and at our follow-up appointment, we discussed the results of the bloods and the scan. Jessie at this stage was still asymptomatic, um, but given her previous ectopic, she wanted the confidence of serial beta HCGs. Um, we agreed that if she became symptomatic um, of an ectopic um, that or, or her HCGs were not reassuring, then we would refer her to the early pregnancy advisory service. Um, so Jessie had actually already made contact with Family Planning Victoria at this stage and had expressed a desire for a medical termination. So the plan at this stage still was just rescan in two weeks and do the serial HCGs. Thank you, Jess. So as is always the way, um, she had her um, beta HCGs on day seven and day nine, so 48 hours apart, and um, they were increasing, but not quite doubling. So this made me anxious. Um, and we discussed the results on the phone on day 11. Um, she was feeling fine at this stage. Um, she didn't have any symptoms suggestive of an ectopic um, and we agreed to keep with the plan of the ultrasound in two weeks. Nevertheless, five days later, um, she um, rang for an urgent appointment. Um, she was feeling quite nauseous and had developed a right-sided abdominal pain. Um, so advised that we needed to get the scan that day and she was able to have it that day. And um, the following, thank you, Jess, result was there. So thankfully it was an intrauterine pregnancy. Um, and so it showed a single um, intrauterine um, pregnancy. It showed the fetal heartbeat and um, the gestational age was dated at six weeks. So at this stage, she contacted Family Planning Victoria and she actually made an appointment with them, which was 
day 22 of the initial um, consult that she had with me. So we're now three weeks on from when she first came to see me. Thank you, Jess. So on day 22, so two, three weeks having seen me for the first time, she went up to the family planning Victoria in Box Hill and had her appointment there. Um, she um, was given the script for the medical termination and was also um, given an implant on, had an implant on inserted the same day. So this is the discharge advice which I received, which I did find really helpful. Um, I'll just read through that with you. So um, they recommended things to look out for. So when reviewing patients, signs of infection, um, making sure that she gave a good history for the miscarriage. So heavy bleeding with clots or possibly seeing the sac um, and then things to consider with ongoing bleeding. So the, which may prompt us to think of retained products. Um, also the discussion on contraception and her, and her mental health. So um, they did a repeat beta HCG on the day of the procedure and then gave her a form to do six to seven days after. Um, and I was CC'd into those results. Um, now, Although helpful, this summary, you know, I do also recognise that there may be challenges with not being the initial provider and giving the, orig the original counselling um, and setting expectations. So that's um, another thing that as a provider or a GP following up um, after procedures is um, helpful to know exactly what the patient's been um, informed of that day. Thanks, Jess. So I saw Jessie two weeks after her medical termination. So, and this was, I keep going back to this, but 36 days after I originally saw her, um, she did give a good history of a successful medical um, abortion. So she had two to four hours of heavy PV loss with pain and clots. And then since then it had been like a light period. So for the last two weeks. Um, her beta HCGs reflected this and she had a drop of more than 80% from the day of the medical termination to seven days later. However, in the last couple of days, she had had heavier bleeding. So she had passed a few more clots and she was having strong offensive smelling discharge. At that stage, no fevers, no pain. Um, her tummy was nice and soft and I couldn't feel a palpable fundus. So I was considering what the causes were here. Endometritis probably being the most common. Um, was the bleeding related in fact to the implanon or was this still all part of a normal process? So we did some swabs and I did start her on a broad spectrum antibiotic and um, with the plan that we would consider an ultrasound if things weren't improving down the track. Thanks Jess. So two weeks later still, um, she'd obviously improved to some extent given that she had taken two weeks to come back to see me, but she had, um, had developed more symptoms prior to coming back at this day 28. So she returned with pressure symptoms. Um, she had continued to, to, um, to bleed. Um, and more recently she had started um, losing some tissue like material. Also of note, she said she had had some dysuria, so stinging when she weed, and she did have a positive urine dip. Um, so again, on her examination, um, the, her, her physical examination was unremarkable other than the urine. So we sent the urine, um, and at this stage, I organized a scan because of the continual bleeding. Thank you, Jess. Now, the following day she returned, she was feeling much worse. She had developed fevers, loin pains, the stinging in um, when she passed urine was much more and her PV loss was much the same. Um, when I examined her this time, she was febrile and she had some flat flank tenderness. So um, I decided to treat as a complicated UTI whilst awaiting results. Um, and so she was given, I think I gave her ciprofloxacin, fluids, 
recommended lots of fluids, Panadol, um, and organized for her to have a pelvis, pelvic scan and a renal scan. And she was booked into the, I've put Women's Health um, Ambulatory Clinic, which is what the early pregnancy advisory service used to be called. And so she was booked there the following day. Thank you, Jess. So the following day she had a scan um, and this showed that, um, um, without reading it out completely, she did have some retained products of conception um, in the endometrial cavity measuring 12 by 12 millimetres and in another area 19 by 9 millimetres. The endometrium was 11 millimetres and both ovaries and, and adenexa areas looked fine. There was no free fluid. So she was seen on the early pregnancy advisory clinic the next day um, and their plan, they repeated bloods um, and they suggested monitoring her HCGs weekly, um, treating the UTI and if things weren't improving in a week to consider rescanning and coming back in. Now I'm glad to say she did feel much better with treating her pyelonephritis um, her PV loss did gradually reduce um, and she actually stopped bleeding completely at six weeks after the medical termination. So she did not need to have a DNC. Um, she did, however, feel quite washed out for some time. Um, I did do her repeat um, hemoglobin and iron studies later that year that were fine. Um, since then, she has actually changed her contraception to an IUD. Um, and she's feeling much better with this. Thanks, Jess. So I've learned a lot through this patient, as I mentioned earlier. There were a number of things along the way that could have been handled differently. I'd like to stress the importance of a good menstrual history and the beta HCGs to help establish the rough gestational age and the optimal timing um, for dating scam. I'd also like to stress the important, um, I'd also um, acting on the results straight away to avoid delay. Um, this could have been made easier by involving other team members in the patient's care, like the practice nurses. Um, the other take home message with this case is that sometimes difficulty or inconsistencies um, if patients have been counseled by another provider. And when returning to you for follow-up, um, this highlights the need um, for setting expectations for women um, with the bleeding pattern and what they might expect. Um, so we're all singing from the same hymn sheet, if you like. This case shows the importance of the support in the form of the secondary care, and in our case, the early pregnancy advisory clinic at Frankston. Um, I haven't gone into the details here about the use of follow-up scans for retained products um, of conception and the indications for this, but I'll let Paddy discuss this a bit further in her talk. The main thing to finish on here is that early medical terminations um, is safe um, and in the vast majority successful. Only a very small percentage, two to five percent, go on to needing a DNC. And it enables women to continue being in their home environment and negates the need for an anaesthetic. So when I saw Jessie through her medical termination, it did inspire me to find out more about providing this service. And I really haven't looked back. Um, I find it really rewarding to be able to offer this service in the community. Thank you, Jess. Um, so this is my second to last slide on the local referral pathways, which I know I've already mentioned, um, but my patients are made aware of these too. So there is a 24 um, seven nurse on call telephone number that provided through MS2 step and it's in their takeaway booklet. There's obviously the GP, the early pregnancy um, advisory clinic, and then out of hours, um, the emergency department, or as I mentioned earlier, um, via the GP, you can speak to the obstetric registrar on call. And thank you, Jess. Finally, um, this is really just to say that I'm, I'm happy to share any of my templates. Um, I've created these for my practice. Um, and I know um, Kath might mention another great resource for templates. 
Um, I'd also like to mention a Facebook group called um, MTOP Providers. Um, oh, what is it called? MTOP Providers. I think it's just called MTOP Providers, but um, it's a closed group um, and you need to be a registered prescriber to join, but it's a really good forum for um, sharing you know, dilemmas and getting experience feedback. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, MTOP docs down under is what it's called. Yes. So um, thank you. That's it. Thank you for listening. And um, obviously, I welcome any questions as they as they come in. Thanks so much, Jess. It sounded like quite a quite a learning curve. I'm going to hand over now to Dr. Patty Moore, and I'll just give me a moment, and I'll put Patty's presentation. Right, over to you, Patty. Mm -hmm. And if I scroll down, do. Yeah, that works. Hello, all, and thank you very much for your attendance this evening. Um, we are going to have questions at the end, but I couldn't help but notice one that popped up in the chat just as uh, Sarah was talking. And I think it went along the lines of, gosh, how common is this presentation? And I thought that's a perfect segue into my talk because um, we want to be able to put the complications or the difficult presentations into perspective. And um, the answer is that UTIs are the most common problem after any gynecological procedure. And that actually includes a medical abortion. So it's actually a really good point that, you know, usually the fever is something like a UTI. Um, and so I'll go on with my talk now to answer that question more directly, is that it's uncommon, really, to have such a long protracted episode of discomfort for this patient post procedure. So just to remind everybody that early medical abortion success rates are really high. So 93 to 98% lead to a complete abortion where nothing else has to be done. <clears throat> In the marimage might be required to evacuate the uterus. Um, and one of the key learnings I'm going to kind of hammer home tonight is that retained products of conception does not mean automatically that one has to have a curette. And I think in a lot of our minds, certainly when I trained in ONG, that was the way we thought. We thought that every miscarriage had to have a curette and every retained products of conception had to have curettes. But we have really moved towards medical and indeed expectant management. And a lot of the advice we give with regard to how to, how to manage things after an early medical abortion is based on the work of how you follow up patients who've had uh, some ongoing bleeding post-surgical abortion or post-medical management of miscarriage. So there's quite a lot of evidence about how to manage the troublesome bleeding, for example. Um, the other key point is that expectant management of probable retained products of conception is appropriate up to two weeks. So I'm saying sit on your hands really sit on your hands if you can. And if I can encourage people at the end of this session to feel more comp confident to not intervene early, um, it makes a huge difference because most of the time these things resolve. So don't ultrasound everyone who has bleeding that's going on beyond seven days and really think about my presentation is going to try and get us to really think about who we would scan and who we wouldn't scan. Um, this is just a reminder <clears throat> that um, and I couldn't agree more with Sarah about the need to really uh, have a consistent um, methodology of how we explain what the early medical abortion is going to be like to the best of our ability. Um, and that when, when you're looking after the patient in a holistic way before, during and afterwards, you know what you've said previously. 
because one of the most um, common things we hear from women who may have had their procedure somewhere else is, but that's not what the other doctor told me. And you just don't know quite what has been said. So a lot of what Kath and I do is around having <clears throat> uniform uh, patient information and we share that with, uh, inter, uh, we share that across the states and around Victoria. So we're mainly all saying the same things <clears throat> and that there's a, a reputable go-to box of tools that we can use with our patients. So this is just me reminding you that, you know, it is, a, we are by definition causing a miscarriage using mifepristone to, to stop the placentation and therefore terminate the pregnancy. And then using misoprostol to open the cervix and cause the um, endometrial lining and the contents of the endometrium to expel through the cervix. So that is not a, uh, an uncomplicated uh, issue for a lot of people that causes pain, um, often similar or more uh, painful than their menstrual cramps. And the vaginal bleeding we do know goes on for a medium median of eight to 13 days. So it's important to have those kinds of um, uh, realistic expectations for patients. I have heard it described as just like a period. It's much more like a really heavy period or a spontaneous miscarriage. So making reference back to how the patient in the past has managed maybe other miscarriages or how they manage their periods helps to give you a, a line of reference or indeed indicate to you someone who might possibly not be a good candidate. And I'm thinking about a patient I had who had um, uh, stage two endometriosis and had a lot of difficulty with pain management uh, at the time of her menses. So she wasn't really going to probably have a, uh, an easy time having a medical abortion. The other side of this slide is I'm just reminding us all of the common side effects of mifepristone and misoprostol. I won't go through, through them all, but they are things that people sometimes present with in the immediate post-procedure, the nausea, the vomiting, and sometimes the fever and chills. And just to remind us that those are well-known side effects of the medication itself. And sometimes watching and waiting over that 24 to 48 hours period is very important. Um, again, I want to put this, flip it on its back and put it into context that, you know, 90% plus of patients are happy with the, the process and would actually choose it again. And that's a very well reproduced uh, piece uh, piece of data. So from um, the first 20,000 scripts that Mari Stopes did around Australia um, and international studies that the vast majority of patients say that they would choose it again or indeed advise it as the methodology for a friend who was um, seeking an abortion. So what people tend to like is the choice, the ability to avoid anesthesia, the privacy and the convenience what they don't like are some of the unavoidable realities of the um, uh, procedure itself. And, prob and these, this is sort of in order of appearance, I've listed them. So prolonged bleeding is the most common um, complaint. The number of visits to the doctor, and indeed once there's, a, once there's a, uh, an adverse outcome, those number of visits, as we saw, um, could go up quite rapidly. The uncertainty as to whether it's complete or not, and the timing of contraception. So I'm now going to look at some of the types of presentations that, um, that um, happen post-procedure. And I'm deliberately not saying complications, I'm talking about a patient presents with an issue or a problem post-procedure. Um, and again, bashing through on my, um, my um, my meme for the evening, which is make sure that you have a follow up plan and it's really clear and that the patient knows what uh, is expected and what when it becomes abnormal and when to seek help. So um, I have looked at some of the questions that came through um, uh, prior to this evening. And so some of them I've addressed directly in the slides that follow and others we can 
look at at the end of the session. So contraception and when to, um, particularly intrauterine contraception, when can you insert post-procedure? What to do about offensive or malodorous discharge? Pain and not having adequate pain um, relief. Um, and representing either to an emergency department or indeed back to your surgery. Um, and what I call troublesome bleeding. So, not, and I'm making, a different, I'm making a definite differential between troublesome bleeding and pathological bleeding because a lot of the bleeding is troublesome to the patient but will probably settle down. And then uh, finally, I want to explore the patient who returns with pregnancy, ongoing pregnancy symptoms. Um, so uh, this is a very typical story. Jenny's 40 years old. She's gravid of four para three. She's separated from her children's father and she's in a new relationship. Um, she has regular periods. Her last period was five weeks ago and she has a positive pregnancy test today in the office. So uh, not dissimilar to um, Sarah's patient. This is a woman who knows when her last period was She's suspicious that she might be pregnant and she's doing something about it early. <clears throat> Her beta HCG that day was 1,900. And this is just to show you the kind of thing that you would see. So Sarah was talking about a patient with a beta HCG of 460, I think it was, something around that level. Um, what we would typically say is that we wouldn't normally expect to see a good going gestational sac with a yolk sac. And I hope with the eye of faith, you can all see the yolk sac there. This gestational sac is approximately um, uh, approximately one centimeter across. And that's exactly what you would expect at around about a beta HCG of 1900. You wouldn't expect to see a fetal heart. So this is the minimum to prove that this is not an ectopic pregnancy. <clears throat> and we would expect to see that at around about 1,000. If we were to do uh, an analysis of the products that would be passed, this is the kind of thing that we would see. Now, I'm not suggesting people do this in their own home. This was done as part of a study when I was working in Auckland, as you can see, where um, at that stage, patients um, were required um, to pass the products in, um, in an abortion clinic. And that's the way early medical abortion has been rolled out in lots of countries in the world. So this is just to show you what that sac would look like. So that's that. And it's just over a centimeter in size. Um, but that's not exactly what the patient's going to see. And there's often a lot more bleeding than that. But it can help us uh, reassure the patients about the approximate size of what they're going to pass. And, being aware realistically about how much bleeding they're going to, to see. So obviously the size of the products of conception increases um, exponentially with each ongoing week. So the whole key with early medical abortion is to do it early, to make an early diagnosis and to do it early. Now, Jenny wants an IUD. And so you've arranged for her to come back in three weeks time. Um, you have already called her on the day of the procedure and you've obtained that she had heavy PV loss two hours after the misoprostol. So that's a good history of um, uh, uh, passing the products of conception. This is also a really typical story. She didn't see the products of conception because she sat on the toilet where she felt the most comfortable and passed something. Um, and the pain settled quickly and the bleeding settled quickly after that. So that is the history of a passage of products. You don't have to see them. Um, and most patients don't actually see them. Um, she had light bleeding for seven days and now she bleeds every time she goes to the gym or has a run. So she's feeling well. Um, she doesn't have any ongoing pregnancy symptoms. Um, and uh, she's just a bit annoyed that she still has some PV loss when she makes any aerobic effort. Now her beta HCG 
on day 17. You'd arranged to do it on day 14, but you didn't get round to doing it till day 17, and it's gone down to 669. Now, the practice point I want to, to suggest to you is that she doesn't, didn't necessarily have a beta HCG of 1,900 as here on the day that she had her procedure. So always think about the time between the date of the beta HCG and the time of the procedure when you're thinking about what it probably would have been at that point. So at 669, is it safe to insert the IUD? Could this be retained products? So the point I'm trying to make here is that retained products of conception is really a clinical decision rather than an ultrasound diagnosis. So this woman is well, her bleeding has settled and it's now really only coming about when she's um, exerting herself. And a beta HCG of 669 is an appropriate drop. If we waited to, and some, pay, some doctors are concerned, and this is based on a lot of the kind of questions I get um, when GPs ring in, that the beta HCG has to be negative. <clears throat> so my answers to my own questions here is, it, uh, it could be some slight amount of retained products, but it's not clinically significant. Does it matter? Probably not. Would a scan help? Probably not. And if we were to scan her, this is the sort of thing that we would see because I was scanning all of the patients at this stage. And so she has a very thin endometrium. This is a complete abortion here, if we did scan her. This is exactly what we want to see. Um, so the points are that you don't need the beta HCG to be less than five. You don't need to have had a proper period. You don't need to do serial beta HCGs. It's acceptable to insert it if the beta HCG shows an appropriate fall, if the patient's well, if there's no sign of infection, and if their bleeding is on a settling trajectory. The thing that I would share with you as someone who's done um, a lot of early pregnancy miscarriage work and a lot of abortion work, both surgically and medically, is that there is always blood in the uterus after a surgical abortion. And we put IUDs routinely in at that stage. So if I can reassure you about that, a lot of work has been done scanning patients post-surgical abortion at two to three weeks, and it always looks like there's a bit of material in here. Just out of interest, that's a corpus luteum, probably still persisting from her previous cycle. <clears throat> another case history, so another type of presentation, Georgie's 24, gravid 2 para naught. She also uh, is seeking an early medical abortion, having made the diagnosis herself at some five weeks gestation. She also shares with you that she's had her previous early medical abortion in Germany and she had no issues there. Um, uh, had no complications at all. So she's very familiar with the process. She has a beta HCG of 4,500 on day one. She has an implanon inserted on the day of the Mifepristone, which is quite acceptable to do. On the day of the procedure, uh, on the day when she takes her misoprostol, she gives a good history of passage of products of conception. What she starts to notice is some malodor in her PV loss uh, over the last three days. And you are again seeing her at day 14 for your follow-up. And the cramping pain has returned in the last 24 hours. <clears throat> so like um, your patient again, Sarah, this is a case where we might start to suspect endometritis. Um, why? Because it's not heavy, heavy bleeding. There's a history of malodor and she's starting to get pain, which may well be um, an indication. And the practice points here is that it is important to examine the patient and to take swabs. So you're not only um, examining to take the swabs, but you're checking to see if there is um, any um, uh, pain or tenderness over the, either the uterine fundus or indeed the cervix on cervical excitation. It's important to, if you think it's endometritis, to treat it empirically while awaiting the results, but really important to take those swabs, even if the previous swabs are normal um, or negative. Use a broad, a broad spectrum antibiotic. Now, endometritis may present with prolonged or return of bleeding rather than the offensive PV loss. 
And it's a clinical diagnosis based on the exam and on the history, rather than uh, requiring um, full blood count with elevated CRP or an ultrasound scan. So if, if it is presenting as endometritis, it probably is. Incidence of endometritis after MTOP sits at about 2%. Now, troublesome bleeding. So the point about troublesome bleeding is that it's common and it's usually not pathologic and most will resolve. The clinical assessment is the most important part and do consider expectant management for at least two weeks if the patient is stable. So if the patient gives a history of only uh, soaking one pad over a day is otherwise systemically well, there's no cardiovascular compromise, um, that is a stable patient and that's someone that you could manage expectantly without recourse to an ultrasound scan. Um, it's worth considering the role of hormonal contraception. And we do know that um, Starting the pill is fine at, uh, on day one after expelling the products. So is having an implanon inserted. Both of those, um, both of those could complicate the post-procedural bleeding pattern, particularly implanon, or if someone is not able to um, comply with taking the pill every day. So always consider the role of hormonal contraception um, in the story of the amount of blood that is lost. The majority of retained products will self-correct. So the point again here is if the patient's stable and the bleeding is on a, uh, a mild trajectory, what is doing a scan going to prove? And um, the ultrasound findings alone don't necessarily determine the management. We've seen a case presented just so nicely by Sarah that shows that Yes, there, were, there was evidence of small amounts of retained products of conception, but it didn't actually affect the patient's management. The patient had a rip-roaring UTI, which needed to be treated. <clears throat> um, this is the kind of thing that we're all worried about. Um, this is what most people who are continuing to bleed look like, but this is what we're all worried about. This is uh, a pregnancy in which the products haven't passed at all. And the typical history of that is a bit of bleeding after the miso has been given. The pregnancy is demised, it just hasn't come out. So it's what we would call a mis miscarriage or retained products of conception here. The patient might report ongoing cramps and a bit of PV loss or discharge going on more than two weeks. And their PV loss has increased um, over the last few days or so. And very importantly, they haven't had that beta HCG drop of um, more than 80%. So they've had something that's less than 80%. <clears throat> These are some images of what retained products might look like on scan. And you, any of you who've been involved in scanning someone who's post miscarriage with ongoing bleeding or post an early medical abortion, or indeed post delivery, who's got some prolonged lochia are really familiar with the report that says the endometrium uh, is somewhat thickened, um, measuring 12 by 14 by 45 millimeters. This is consistent either with clot and debris or retained products of conception. It's impossible to tell the difference most of the time. So this patient here has got retained products of conception here, and you can probably see with the eye of faith that it's just that slightly whiter image. These never reproduce as well as they are when you're actually scanning. And in this case, it was 16 millimeters by 34 by 20. The 34 is the length. And so it's really the overall calculation that we're concerned about. And so this is about a 25 millimils. This is what's significant with the Doppler is that in this case, there's quite a lot of vascularity here. But the presence of vascularity itself doesn't necessarily say whether or not we would need to do anything further about this patient. What's going to be important with this patient, as with um, the other patients, is What's her bleeding like? If she's telling us that she's been bleeding for five weeks and she can't tell whether she's had her period or not, but the, there was a, a week in there when it got a lot worse, that's highly significant. If she tells us like Jenny that she only bleeds now when she's got 
um, uh, uh, goes for a run or goes to the gym or lifts weights or something, then you know she's stable. And so it's really a clinical decision whether or not we need to do um, further intervention. So when to scan, and so this is my other meme for the evening, is chase the symptoms, not the scan. The length of bleeding is really the most significant thing. Has it gone more than two to three weeks? Does it wax and wane? Is it a new onset? And remember that menses may well overlap with post-procedure bleeding. I've seen that many, many times where they've been bleeding on and off for about three weeks and then they get a really heavy bleed. And when you analyze it, it's around about day 25, 26, 27, and it could actually be return of menses, which often settles things down. Assessment of the bleeding in, in includes passage of a history of passage of clots. How many pads are they soaking? And this is a very simple thing, like if it's greater than one per hour and not settling over two hours, um, that would necessitate that you really need to examine them, do a cardiovascular assessment, check to see if there's products of conception in the um, cervix. And if there are, that's the sort of person who doesn't need a scan, they need to be referred um, to the emergency department. So again, it's really, I'm, I'm really pushing this, that it's a clinical diagnosis. It may, there may be a role for ultrasound in determining the management. Um, as with miscarriage, our usual rule of thumb is if the retained products are less than 50 millimeters um, squared, the role, uh, the, um, it's, it's okay to do expectant management or to even consider repeating the misoprostol. And we can talk about re repetition of misoprostol and the difficulties for practitioners who don't have access to that. Um, chase the symptoms, not the scan result. And if settling, do wait. And think of other reasons why the patient might be uncomfortable. For example, check the urine. Um, so the practice points are to no really normalize bleeding. Don't poo-poo it, but make it really clear to the patient that it will go on uh, 12 to 14 days. And practice expectant management and review. And with clear prompts, prompts to seek further review or referral. And we will talk about the resources. Kath's going to share those with you, the written, reverbal, and online. Sorry, I apologize. My daughter is um, sending me some psychosocial crisis that her and her friend are having <laughs> at the moment, and I'm just going to ignore it. Um, so pain presentations. Um, here's a typical one. Had an MTOP last week through the local GP, comes back to see you in the clinic. It may have been you or it may be your colleague and wants stronger pain relief. What are the next steps? What's happening? Is that, could this be retained products of conception? Could it be um, endometritis? Um, or could it be that the pain relief was inadequate in the first place? And then this is one of those cases where we, we really do need to think about other causes for pain and also other causes of distress that might be presenting as pain. So having a really, really clear pre-procedure, clear expectations about managing the pain. As I said before, screen your patients for suitability. If they already have a sensitized pelvis or a history of chronic pain, reconsider whether they're suitable. How did they manage their previous miscarriages? And be really proactive with the pain relief. So prior to the MISO admission, administration, I really suggest loading a loading dose with the um, anti-emetic so that the patient's already got non-steroidals on board. Um, a large um, uh, uh, quantitative study, uh, the largest one that has been performed with over 5,000 patients in both arms has shown that coding in combination with non-steroidals is the most effective pain relief in that 24 to 48 hour period. Um, and getting the timing right for MIFI and MISO is another practice point. We know that um, patients like to use an early medical abortion so they can manage their life. Women are so busy. It's not uncommon for me to see a patient who wants to commence the MIFI and MISO over the weekend when they may have childcare available, et cetera. But just be really careful that the patient isn't thinking that she might do a day's work 
and then get the children to bed and then just um, take the misoprostol and just um, hopefully miscarry quietly and not bothering anyone overnight. I've had several patients with extreme pain be admitted uh, in the middle of the night. And I think it's because they've been exhausted when they started the process. Post-procedure clear info about expectation of pain and that the resolution is that it will pass after the products of conception and to, if, if one can to get, as Jenny did, sit on the toilet, get the pain relief to work, look at the clock and see if it's starting to settle after the two hours. Persistent pain is a flag for review and it's associated with clot retention or clot retained in the cervix or a large amount of retained products or infection. So pain going on before, beyond the 12, uh, beyond the um, three to four days post procedure, that really is a flag that you need to assess the patient. And then finally, and this is not common to um, uh, feedback to the patient, to the doctor who asked how common are all these um, problems? This is really uncommon but this is the thing that we all worry about. There is a 1% chance of a failed abortion, a failed medical abortion, slightly greater than with uh, a surgical, but I'm here to tell you as a surgical abortionist that surgical abortions do fail and their failure is missed as well. But this sits at about 1% for um, early medical abortion. And it's really important that we think about it and have a high index of suspicion when we're seeing a patient again. Timing is everything when we're trying to assess um, someone who might present with ongoing pregnancy symptoms. The date of the MIFI and the MISO. Um, if it was six weeks ago and they think that they had their menses in between, this could be another conception. Ask about the history of the passage of products of conception. The beta-HCG is extremely important, but wait at least 14 days post-procedure <clears throat> when we're assessing that. And um, if it's less than a 90, a less than an 80% decline or indeed an increase, that is reason, it's a trigger for us to do um, an ultrasound in those situations. So again, clinical patients saying she still feels nauseated has got um, uh, abdominal bloating or sore breasts and hasn't had enough passage of material. She, you don't think when you re-examine her or re-talk to her. Remember, and this is a practice point, that the beta HCG goes up, 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 up to 12 weeks and then it starts coming down again. So patients can present with ongoing persistent pregnancy symptoms and give a history of missing two periods. And the beta HCG is just confusing at that point. So always think about when the, um, uh, when the MIFI was given. If it's static or increasing, arrange an ultrasound scan. This is actually a missed miscarriage. Now this is not a failed abortion. It's often referred to us in the emergency department, retained products or a, mis a missed miscarriage are, refined, are, are referred to us as a failed medical abortion. And I think it's very important to be careful of the language we use, especially with the patients. So this pregnancy is demised as a result of the MIFI, but the MISA wasn't quite as effective as we might have hoped for. And so this is this pregnancy is demised at eight weeks, which was the day that she took her MIFI as opposed to this patient who had, the next patient who had an increasing beta HCG. And this is what we, we all dread for the patient and, um, and for ourselves as we try to negotiate how we're going to help the patient. So the incidence of a continuing pregnancy is one to 2%. It's slightly greater if the patient has the early medical abortion incident drugs at, like, at greater than eight weeks. It's really uncommon but it requires screening for and an index of suspicion. So if you never think it's possible, you won't ask the right questions. The same as after a surgical abortion, we have missed all hospitals that, uh, and, and places that provide surgical abortion have missed ongoing pregnancies because they haven't asked the right questions. So beta HCG is much more reliable when you're assessing um, amenorrhea after an early medical abortion or ongoing pregnancy symptoms. That's more sensitive than the history the patients might give you. Some patients might actually have bled from some hemorrhage around the sac, but have not actually um, terminated the pregnancy. 
we'll talk about the referral pathway, but I see this as an emergency. And this to me warrants an immediate response from us as a tertiary hospital or anyone at a secondary hospital, because this has not, this has been um, a, a failure of a medical procedure and therefore should be escalated. I personally um, take, the, take the attitude to these cases that the woman should not have to go back through the whole system again and try to negotiate um, the, the whole system to try and find herself a surgical abortion if that's what she wants. Um, and does require quite a lot of support to make those decisions. And so 1-800-MY-OPTIONS and indeed us at the Royal Women's Hospital would respond really quickly um, to try and get this patient um, seen if that was what she wanted. If, if uh, just on the other hand, with regard to uh, a patient who might consider continuing in this situation, and some do, and I have met women who do, there is uh, no... Um, concern that there would be a fetal abnormality as a result of the mifepristone or the misoprostol. The dose of misoprostol um, that we use for um, medical abortion is so much less than has been associated with uh, the teratogenicity. That's when misoprostol is used to manage, um, in really high doses to manage um, peptic ulcers. And mifepristone is not teratogenic. So we can be reassuring about that. And so just to finish up, what can we offer advice and clinic with regard to clinical setup and really helping you um, develop um, and think through the stages you would need to go through as Sarah has so um, eloquently told us about how she organized her local support group around her. Um, and one of the biggest things is to link you to a community of practice. And I'll pass over to Kath about um, what we can offer in terms of resource sharing and um, the community of practice and patient info sheets, etc. And we'll, could you share the mm. info sheet that we have developed? Sure. Yeah, that's sharing. So um, this is um, something that we pinched from another great um, friend of ours, a care provider from um, Adelaide, and modified it for the um, Victorian situation. Um, and it's information, it's a one page or two sides, information for those who've had the medical abortion, what's normal, what's not, um, and then answer these really simple questions. Do I feel well? Have the cramps settled or gone away? Has the bleeding stopped or almost stopped? Have the pregnancy feelings in my body gone away? And it just makes them reflect back as to what actually has happened. Because a lot of people are so keen to just move on that they're, they're not really thinking about what they are experiencing. And then if you've answered yes, you don't need to see a doctor. If you've answered no to any of the questions, you do need to see a doctor and take this sheet with you. Um, and then some instructions about how you um, see the who, who you would contact, who your nearest one is. And then on the other side, the flip side of this is some instructions for the medical team who might be seeing them. So um, Sarah's got a great team um, at Frankston Hospital, but not all the doctors who would be staffing the um, uh, emergency departments 24 hours a day would know all of this and certainly we had to engage in a lot of teaching of our medical staff around how to manage these kinds of presentations and so this is really a uh, not a cheat sheet but a directive um, to the doctors that and nursing staff who would be seeing the patient um, and we're just Kath and I were talking about we're going to we're going to um, animate this aren't we we're mm -hmm. going to make it a much more sort of user friendly and obvious um, than uh, a little bit more like this kind of graphic. Mm. And over to you, Kath, about mm. our resource. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Patty. That was a really helpful summary, actually. Um, now I'm going to go back to uh, the room. 
Excuse me while I get the right one up. I'll just okay. So thanks, Patty, for that um, presentation. That, that actually was a very helpful summary um, for me because through, and I'm just going to talk about the clinical champion project initially, and then some of the other resources that are available, uh, that are readily available to you um, uh, outside of the women's. So the Clinical Champion Project is a statewide project and our role is around supporting clinicians um, to uh, develop some skills, new skills and knowledge and, and confidence to be able to manage both uh, medical abortion and LARC uh, procedures. So just in terms of medical abortion, we have been writing a couple of um, policy guideline procedures. At the moment, just one sits on our website, um, but we've got a couple coming up. Um, there'll be, uh, so the medical abortion to nine weeks is currently on our website. And in the next couple of weeks, the uh, principles of assessment and care uh, PGP will be coming up. And I'm in also in the process of developing up uh, a guideline around managing what we've been talking about tonight, managing uh, a presentation or a complication post procedure. The other thing that we do in the Clinical Champion Project at the Women's, uh, it's, it's probably the aspect of our project that's been most impacted by COVID, is education and training in um, Implanon and IUDs. Um, both of those are on hold. We have tried to do some Implanon uh, practical workshops uh, virtually, but it's it's quite it's tricky and we haven't sort of set up a system. But if you are interested in that, um, send me an email and I'll keep you on the on the list. And ultimately, also what we're trying to do is support um, the um, the sexual and reproductive health um, workforce by sharing the expertise, such as you've heard tonight, um, and. And as well as uh, our project is um, funded through the Department of Health, who have also funded eight sexual and reproductive health hubs around the state. Some of those hubs were um, pre-existing uh, models of service delivery and other hubs, such as you have at um, Monash Health and Peninsula Health, um, uh, developing services from the ground up. Um, ultimately, the aim is that for each of the, all, all of the hubs that they are the uh, they are the key providers for medical abortion and um, IUD and implanton procedures. Um, and as Patty said, there are some pre-existing clinical networks that you're welcome to join into. The um, email address is just there for. Um, so she's the Centre for Excellence in Rural Sexual Health. And about every quarter, we have a clinical network um, meeting for unintended um, pregnancy and abortion. And the case study that you've heard tonight would be a fairly typical type um, presentation. Or we've, in the past, we've had the most recent one was a discussion around conscientious objection. Uh, and then when COVID first hit us, we we had a meeting, a couple of meetings actually, talking about how our model of care, uh, we could adapt our model of care. Through that network with Search and 1800, which I'll talk about in a minute, we also produce an e-newsletter that, that comes out around about every quarter. And I'd really encourage you also to have a look at the Search resources um, online. They have a, what's what they call a resource hub. And they have you know, every resource that you might think um, that's relevant in terms of either planning, uh, sexual and reproductive health services. Sarah mentioned uh, she's willing to share her templates. There's also templates on the resource hub. So I really encourage you to have a look at that. And the uh, search also have, uh, they're up to 12 uh, e-learning modules, medical abortions one, the latest one is on uh, syphilis, 
the, and it's all free. You just need to go through the website to register yourself so that you can um, get online to you do that. to be rural. And you don't have to be rural. We're actually... Oh, yes, Sersh. Sersh is based in, um, uh, well, it's it's based at the University of Melbourne um, Centre. Oh, sorry, I can't think of the name, but it's Rural Sexual Health. Yeah, Sexual Health. Um, but, yeah, you definitely don't, don't have to be rural. And, actually, the resources that Sersh have developed um, uh, Patty and search family planning and uh, uh, formed a, a network many years ago when medical abortion first uh, came into Australia, recognising that clinicians needed to su some support around developing care. Um, Patty mentioned 1800 My Options, um, and I would really encourage you to have a look. Uh, at 1800 My Options because it's a very important database so that women and pregnant people who are looking at accessing either abortion care, whether it's medical or surgical or LARC care, and they also have a database for pregnancy um, options counselling. Um, if you were interested in uh, registering yourself, you can either be uh, register as uh, public or private. And if it's uh, so, it's a, a website, so anyone can see the, the publicly available information. Um, but people can also uh, ring that number that you see there on your screen, and 1800 My Options would um, ask a, a, some screening questions of the caller to identify, um, you know, what sort of service they need, what gestation they think they are, they or they know they they are, um, and you know what and try to provide them with a couple of uh, options. Uh, so yeah, I'd really encourage you to think about getting involved because the more that your services are access, uh, accessible, the more women are able, able, able to, um, uh, to use, mm. use that service. So amongst all of that, I I'm gonna stop sharing now and just go to the chat because I haven't had a chance to look at the chat. And we are at 12 minutes past. So, so that was the first question that I answered, how common is this? Yep. Yeah, and I'll just read out this question because I haven't read it myself. And thanks, Nicole, for the question. Are you prescribing pain relief with medical abortion medication? What pain relief or does it depend on client? Thank you. And there's a second question there. Do you want to answer that first? Mm -hmm. Well, maybe we'd just ask Sarah, because I talked about how I'm, I'm really keen on um, really proactively having a really good pain relief regime. What's your regime, Sarah? Mm. So uh, much like you mentioned, actually. So the day that they get the script from me, I give them um, a prescription for Panadine Fort. Um, and then I also advise they take an anti-inflammatory, so Nurofen, just by ibuprofen over the counter. Um, and to take, um, and I give them a script for ondansetron as well. So I recommend they take the ondansetron before um, the MIFI and then again before the misoprostol um, and the pain relief at the same time after the second lot. So, yeah. It's a really have a concentrated effort of giving them good relief early on so you're not chasing the pain. Yeah. yeah. And the resources talk about that as well. Then I think it's still the same question, mm. questioner mm. saying, do you find any of these patients require any psychological support around the decision-making processes or post-procedure? So yes is the answer. And I think um, Kath referred to 1-800-MY-OPTIONS has become a very good Victorian-based database about what patients or what women and pregnant people contacting the service want and need from us. And um, over 90% know that they want an abortion and are seeking um, uh, a resource to get the abortion. Around about 8% uh, request um, counselling or options clarification or values clarification, it's called. And um, 1800 can refer for those kind of um, services as well. 
which are albeit not quite as common as we might wish them to be, but 8% is quite a, quite a reproducible number, both nationally and internationally. And when we audited our practice over a 10 year period here at the Women's, it sits at 8%. Um, so some people do, just as an, uh, do require help, um, post-procedure, it sits at about 4%. And so it's important to know where you can refer patients. 1-800 has got a list of psychologists who bulk bill mm. as well, which is good. Um, the Women's isn't able to offer, you know, psychological support to everybody. What's your experience, Sarah? Um, with I'm on mute. No, I'm not. Um, so probably much the same, actually. I always offer it. So I offer it, obviously, before they, whilst they're in the um, decision-making stage and then after as well at that follow-up appointment. Um, those who express an interest um, of the patients I've had actually have a psychologist anyway. So um, they already have an active mental health care plan and are seeing someone. So they... Um, some, a handful of people would take that opportunity to actually um, and, and time to, to see the psychologist that they're used to seeing just to talk through their um, choices and decisions. Um, I haven't I haven't instigated a new mental health care plan and referred someone for that sole purpose of psychology around the medical termination. I think there would be the potential of a quite a time delay um, with trying to get in to see someone um, potentially. So that's that's really helpful knowing that one eight hundred options has 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 that um, those specialists available. Mm. Mm. So I think those might have been the ones that came through tonight, but there were some preloaded questions. One was about marina insertion, and I think I've. I've discussed that. Mm -hmm. That's the first one. So I'll just read mm. this one out so that we're all on the same page. What to do if no bleeding after first MS2 step taken correctly when still less than 63 days gestation? And the question's asking, can we give a second dose of, a dose of mysel as a GP with MS2 step training or, or do we need local gynae input? Mm. Now, I had meant to talk about that in one of the slides. I said, I'll get to that. And then I forgot to talk about it. Um, you can give an extra dose of misoprostol. Um, you can't actually re-prescribe on the PBS MS2 step again, which might actually work, you know, if you gave it another go if they hadn't passed. But it's not actually um, on the PBS, so it would cost the patient a bucket load compared to the price of a script. So it'd be about $450. Um, the issue with the misoprostol is that if you're not working in a clinic, prescribing misoprostol for a patient is very inefficient because the box has 100 tablets in it and you want to give them a dose of four tablets. So I don't know if you've ever thought, of, thought around this. So at our clinic, we can send out four tablets if we wanted to give more. At other clinics that I've worked at, we gave a package of some additional miso so that if they rang in, we would say, no, take the next dose. Now, the research on it as to whether it's really effective is really equivocal. So some practitioners swear by it and they're real, mm. I call them miso pushers. They just love the stuff. They um, would give another dose and then another dose and not bother with a scan until they've tried three doses or something but misoprostol itself can cause that feverish feeling mm. nausea sometimes vomiting abdominal pain it itself can cause ongoing symptoms do you so i have i have over the years actually gone for more expectant management and less of the miso um, and haven't noticed it's uh you know, I haven't I haven't noticed a, a terrible deficit to not re-prescribe miso. Do you have an attitude about that, Sarah? Have you given miso before? No, I haven't. Um, and I think it would be an inhibiting thing, you know, the fact that I wouldn't be able to prescribe it. I mean, you can get a special license, I think, can't you, to be able to prescribe it. And I know a GP used to give it pre-IUD to mm. null it. Um, 
and they had an arrangement with the pharmacist whereby they could pay per tablet, but it's not oh, something. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You could prescribe it, but you're prescribing by a box. And so another doctor I talked to actually prescribed a box uh, for, some, for a patient or something, or the patient gave the box back to them. Yeah. <laughs> and then they kept it for the next 25 patients as well, you know? Um, and handed them out when they were there. But it you ha would have to be creative to do it. But when you work in a hospital or a clinic, you can have a box and cut it up. It's much easier. Yeah. yeah. Um, yep. But you certainly don't need a gynecologist to prescribe the miso. But I think the question would be to assess that patient to see how they were going, to see if there was something else going on or you know, just a suspicion of uh, a failed MTOP. Mm -hmm. Thanks, and Patty. Question, yes. Yeah, so there was another question there just around the sc uh, screening swabs that you'd recommend uh, prior to medical abortion. Is a high vaginal swab necessary in all women? And if so, is high vaginal swab for micro microculture and se sensitivity sufficient? Or, do you, or, or what would you do? You know, trike, MG? and chlamydia. chlamydia. Mm. So look, the, the rule of thumb is infection is as, in co is as common whether you choose a medical abortion or a surgical abortion. So they're worth screening for and you should do the same screening, whether it's medical or otherwise. So the, the recommendations as to what we screen for varies quite a lot from country to country and from area to area. So, um, the, the most important ones to exclude would be, uh, at the moment, would be gonorrhea and chlamydia. So you would need to swab for those. Um, and I would recommend um, screening for bacterial vaginosis because it's, um, it's a catalyst for the ascension of other bugs. So it becomes an, you know, an anaerobic aid to other infection. Mm. The mycoplasma genitalium is really variable as to who screens for mycoplasma genitalium. So there are some communities that really have really high um, carriage rate. If you speak to a sexual health physician, they'll all want to screen for mycoplasma genitalium. We screen in our hospital, uh, but I know that other, uh, some of the other really big providers privately do not screen for mycoplasma genitalium. But I would do the, the high vaginal swab because bacterial vaginosis can really be a, a you know, a catalyst to, to infection. Mm -hmm. what, what about you, Sarah? What's your attitude? Well, I do a vaginal swab, high vaginal yeah. swab, the chlamydia and gonorrhea screen, but I don't ask for trichomonas or mycoplasma. Yeah. Other questions coming through. Um, I think we might have. Yeah, when do we decide to one? repeat yeah. the dose of miso? Yeah. Um, there's a question. I work with young people and concern they they make this decision based on fear from the family, not really the decision they want to make. Okay. I think Sarah's request uh, is correct in having the practice nurse there as a support, even in a couple of weeks post procedure for the clients to call. Yeah, so it's, we'll take that as a comment, please. Mm, mm. Um, and with the discussion around tablets, do the pharmacies provide Cetamancer tablets rather than the whole box? Oh, I think we've on? also addressed yeah. that, that you'd be lucky to get a pharmacist that would sit there with a pair of scissors and hand them. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. Okay, so I'm just quickly going through the questions. I think we've answered all of the questions. And this is a point of the webinar where we find it so tricky because we know there are 26 people out there, but we can't see any of you. Mm. So, so we um, hope you're not scared to ask a question. No, no question or gone is to done. Sleep. We've all asked <laughs> no the same question done. three times probably. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. 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 Um, and I will follow up with. Uh, um, eventually, you'll get this email recording, which I said will be de-identified. And I will follow up with an email to each participant just to um, provide you with copies of the various resources, um, the policy guideline procedures, that one, uh, that um, page for emergency, um, that 
a woman or a pregnant person could take to emergency department and a couple of other things that the Clinical Champion Project have developed that are not currently on our website, but we're actually in the process of um, working, we've got a working group internally that are looking at revamping the various resources around abortion and contraception care um, to add things like this recording and, and, and make those um, policy guideline procedures a little bit more accessible. All right, well, we've got a couple of minutes. If anyone's got... Um, oh, some nice thank yous coming through. Yeah, but that's thank nice. You. Yeah. Thank you, because it is tricky. <laughs> we felt that on the first, first uh, webinar, because actually if COVID had, had, had not have happened, we would have done this face to face. Yeah. To have the opportunity to meet up with you, but... Um, but we've also been really um, interested in the fact, haven't we, Kath, that more people than ever mm. are coming to our community of practice events, mm. you know, and it's because it's obviously easier. Mm. Yeah, and there is an efficiency in it. So mm. uh, I think uh, in an ideal world, we'll run a hybrid. Mm. You know, we'll have some some uh, face to face and some on the webinar. And all the webinar ones will be recorded. So, mm, mm, yeah, which is really helpful mm. because you can review yeah. it at a later time, later time, and share it amongst your colleagues um, as well. All right. All right. Okay. Well, if there's no other questions, let's take an early minute. Thanks so much to Jess for organising uh, this event, and hopefully we will see the participants. Um, at another event, uh, and and perhaps even through the search, some of the search uh, forums, the clinical um, network meeting. And I just suggest to the just to the panelists that we might just have a little bit of a uh, an initial assessment of how how the evening ran. So we stay online. Good night to you all, and thanks again for yeah. your attention. Thanks so much, and we'll be in touch. Thank you.